Well, good morning, everybody. We're continuing it all on in our covenant series, God's Covenants. All right, and today we are in, for the first time, we are in part one of the Abrahamic Covenant. And, um, you know, like the Noahic Covenant, I'm going to spend today not talking to you about the covenant. I have to give you why there had to be an Abrahamic covenant. So I need to speak about events that occur before Abram is called out of Mesopotamia. All right? Um, it's, it's the same thing as Noah as um, in order to preach to you about the Noahic covenant, I had to first talk to you about the sons of God and their fall from heaven and having sex with human women, creating another, an unholy bastard race called the Nephilim. And that this was a fall. This was an angelic fall, no less than the fall we see in Genesis chapter 2 when uh, the man you identify as Satan falls. All right? Which was one of the wowies from that sermon is my contention is that that was actually, when you read Genesis chapter 2, you are reading about that spirit being that you call Satan or Lucifer. You are reading about his actual fall. Now, obviously, he's already fallen because he conspired in his mind and his heart to cause humanity to fall. Only a fallen being will do that. But the manifestation of that fall is, is recorded for us in Genesis chapter 2. So that when God rebukes Adam and Eve, Satan's right there with them. That spirit being is right there with them getting rebuked and cursed. All right, which for me is proof enough that that was the manifestation of that, that being's fall. All right, so I had to talk to you about that fall in Genesis chapter 6, the Noahic flood, all the events leading up to it, before I could talk to you so you understand the significance of the Noahic covenant, right? So that was Genesis chapter 6 through Genesis chapter 10, all right? But I didn't talk to you about all the events from Genesis chapter 6 and Genesis chapter 10. Because in Genesis chapter 11, the narrative picks up in a pagan nation. A non-Jewish nation. How can I say that? There are no Jewish people yet. There's no Israel. There's no Jacob. There's no Moses. There's no, no one's been called Israel. All right? And that's really, really significant. Not just for the Jews, but for you in salvation. And I'll just give you a little clue now. When God calls Abram, he is speaking into existence something that does not exist. A people of his own. And he is starting this people with a pagan, with a Gentile. And he's going to separate him and say, you will be Israel. All right? That this is no different than in Genesis chapter 1, when God calls into existence that which was not. And he starts with the words, it's Genesis 1 3, it's my last verse for today. You don't have to put it up, you're going to put it up later. Let there be light. Because, brothers and sisters, is that creative miracle anything less than when the Holy Spirit, whether you recognize it or not, came into you and said to your spirit, let there be light. The light of life, the light of understanding, the light of the gospel, the light of my redemptive reconciliation into adoption. I just fit three words into one sentence about what Jesus did on the cross. You see, what we're doing here is we're building you a strong foundation that throughout, not just in the, Noe, the Adamic covenant, Noahic covenant, Abrahamic covenant, Davidic, Mosaic covenant, Davidic covenant, you can go, wow, there are some things that are uncommon, some things I didn't understand that now I see that the Adamic covenant is just being expanded upon and expanded upon. I want you, when you get to your New Testament, no less than the Apostle John. I want you to be able to read and go, oh, he's calling me back to the Genesis chapter 1. He is speaking now about what he did with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Because this whole book, 
This whole book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Even if it's just the back book that's named the revelation of Jesus Christ, right? That you need to understand the supernatural nature of this book. And I want you to know there's many supernatural books in this world. There's only one problem. The, the books in this world that are supernaturally inspired and used to change a soul, there's only one that does that for the Son of God, the Messiah, God's only plan, plan A of redemption. All the other spiritual books are from the enemy. I'll give you a wonderful example. It's happening right now as we speak. I'm driving on the way here. I passed two mosques. Both the mosques today are packed. And I'm like, huh. I'm like, what's going on? So I typed in, is today a Muslim holiday? And it goes, yes, today's El Assad. I'm like, oh, what's El Assad? I'm probably saying it wrong. Today is the day the Muslim world commemorates Abraham for his obedience in slaughtering Isaac, even though he didn't have to. Because Islam, as well as modern-day Judaism, claims to be a salvific faith in the world. Um, the Roman Catholic Catechism, if you turn to the front pages, it's in the first few pages, they make a public statement saying, Islam and Judaism are sister faiths to ours. I, excuse me. But I heard Jesus tell the sons of Abraham that they were sons of Satan. You can read that in your book. And the same goes for what Islam has done with the Christian faith. Judaism says, well, yeah, we believe in all the same people you do up until the New Testament. And we also don't believe that Jesus is Messiah. And we believe that God saves us by virtue of being ethnic Jews. False gospel. Or you can go over to Islam that'll say, yes, uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Mary, we love all these people. Jesus, wonderful prophet. But Muhammad's greater. He was the prophet God sent after Jesus. False doctrine. Satan and his ministers will come disguised as angels and messengers of light. Meaning, they will come with truth mixed with lies. And so the only way we, we grow in discernment is through the study of the word, meditating, praying on God and his word, and, and being a student, being a disciple of your faith. Anybody can be an infant Christian, and most Christians, I'm sorry to say, are when it comes to doctrine and practice. They just, they just want to sing, you know, Christianity is a big kumbaya religion, and it's not. Christianity is the most exclusive religion on planet Earth because Christianity says you must be born again. You must believe, repent, and put all your trust in Jesus or you're not saved. You can't be. That Jesus is God's plan A. All right? Anyway, I went off script a little bit. So today we're going to go into... Um, I, I, so I had to think of a title, right? And I'm thinking, well, we're, today we're going to talk about the Tower of Babel. I'm like, Tower of Babel? I'm like, well, anyone can write Tower of Babel. I'm like, what would these people be saying when they decide, let's build a tower? That's what they were saying. Let's summon God. Let's command God to come back down and be with us. God already has separated himself in a large way because of the fall that we did read about in Genesis chapter 2. It is not up to man to decide their punishment is over, their fall is over, it's time to God to just... It's not their place. And this is why when you read, and we re, we're going to read chapter 11 today. This is, this is our main scripture for today, Genesis chapter 11. It's like seven or eight verses. God doesn't freak out. He doesn't say, thou art damned. You know, he just says, well, this is interesting. They're trying to get to me? It's like, well, that ain't going to work. I call the shots here. And then he does what he does. All right? 
So let's begin. We're going to begin with, um, we're going to jump ahead a little bit to Genesis chapter 12 to verses 1 through 4. Once again, if you want to be, uh, if you want to follow in your Bibles, you're going to be in Genesis 12, Genesis 11, Genesis 8, Genesis 9. You just have your book open, your Bible open to the book of Genesis, and you'll be able to shoot around and confirm everything that I'm putting up on the slides, okay? Father God, please speak to me. Please speak through me in this um, difficult of subjects simply because I am sure 90 to 100 percent of the people here haven't heard this before and, and they just simply were told things that were more maybe uh, explainable in worldly terms but deny the supernatural context of what we're reading. And that's what they're getting today, Lord. Holy Spirit, teach be glorified in the name of Jesus. Amen. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. Now the Lord, this is now, we have gone from Noah to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. 400 years have gone by, give or take. Five or six generations have passed. That means Tommy grew up, he had a kid, Tommy died, the kid grew up, had a kid, the kid died, the other kid grew up. Had a kid, the kid died. There's some time gone by, right? <clears throat> now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country. Abram's Abraham. The country is Mesopotamia. It's a foreign nation. It's a pagan nation. Very, very significant. Because Mesopotamia, you have, that's the name of the region. It's like the nation, Mesopotamia. Then you have Ur of the Chaldees. So inside Mesopotamia, you have a place called Ur. Inside Ur, no, no, you have a place called the Chaldees. Inside the Chaldees, you have a place called Ur. So Abraham is from Ur of the Chaldees, located in Mesopotamia, all right? Um, and his name, God, when God makes covenant with Abram, he changes his name to Abraham, and he changes Sarai, her wife, his wife, to Sarah. So I'm going to, if you hear me going, saying Abram, Abraham, Abram, Abraham, just know I'm talking about the same person. One's a pagan being called by God. The other one's in covenant with God. All right. Look, now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I'm going to stop there for a second. Go back, please. In um, verse 2, I will make you how many nations? One. This is speaking about the ethnic people of Israel. All right? Later on, he says, I will make many nations out of you. Or from many, I forget what it says. It's in here somewhere today. And that's talking about spiritual salvation. That's going to include you and Gentile. All right, And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whom, him whom dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. And that verse goes on a little bit. I only have the first part of the verse, because that's the point I'm making. The point simply is that Abram heard, right? Read, this is how it applies to us, and then did. <laughs> he went, this is what God says, this is what I'm going to do. Now, you've got to understand the significance of this. This is a pagan. This is a man who grew up with many, many gods. Anyone know who the, the uh, main god of um, Mesopotamia is? Murduk. All right? Murduk is the, um, well, they say they're the God, it's, he's the God figure, and they worship him as the main God. But in their religion, Murduk usurped another God whose name is Anil. What we're seeing in the covenants are, are God writing through Moses and addressing Murduk and Anil and that whole religion of theirs right in the face. 
because if you Christianize, if you give the Christian interpretation of the Babylonian religion, Murduk, Enil, all right, Murduk is the spirit being in Genesis who says to Adam and Eve, did God really, did Enil really say, no, 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 he lied. You can eat and be just like him. And so in the Mesopotamian religion, that being usurped God and took the throne. And that's who they worship. All right? So what, what we're, and, and this goes back to, to cultural context. When we're reading Genesis, all of Genesis, we have to put ourselves into a people who came from pagan world, right? With all different, these different gods and these different stories. And now God is saying, I am going to make you my people and you are getting the truth. The oracles of God. That's what Paul calls them. And they're all refutations of these pagan faiths that are all around them. Isn't that something? So remember we talked about... Uh, we're not there yet. I'll get to that later. So why is God selecting a pagan to become the people of God? God's own possession. That's my first question for you to think about. Why? Why would he choose a pagan? Couldn't God make sons of Abraham out of the stone? Right? Wasn't Adam the person of God? Wasn't Noah the new Adam, the man of God? Remember I talked about that? How the Noahic covenant was a redo of the Adamic covenant. With the basic foundational principle, covenant principle being go forth, multiply, right? and have dominion over the earth. It's common to both covenants, all right? The answer to that question is yes and yes. I mean, Noah was the new Adam. Adam was Adam, right? So reasoning together, we can conclude that there is no need for God to go to another nation and choose one man to leave and become the father of the people of God, right? He's got Noah. That's, that's who's alive right now is Noah and his, well, Noah's dead, but his descendants, all right? They, they should all be the people of God if everything's squared up. Does this make sense? I'm trying to walk you through this so that you understand, all right? Try and stay awake. That line of decency as a people, uh, of descendancy as a people of God would have grown out of Noah's line and expanded from there. That being the case, all people would thus be the people of God. Unless, unless something happened that changed all of this, and something did. First thing that happens is we get uh, God's post-flood pronouncement. After the flood, when he tells Noah to go out, multiply, fill the earth, right? He also makes a statement about the, um, the flood and that he'll never flood the earth in judgment again, all right? Um, he makes a statement regarding mankind and the evil that remains in fallen humanity, beginning with Noah's family, and his, Noah and his sons, and his wives, uh, his sons' wives, sorry. Genesis 8, 21. When the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, because Noah made an offering to God, he said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Now, when God said those words, there was only eight people alive. Noah and his family. So he was basically make a, uh, making a pronouncement that the fall was not fixed through the Noahic flood. All right? Something else has to happen. All right? And we're going to see that he's right. <laughs> In Genesis 10, we continue the Noah story, the Noah narrative. If you count the descendants of Noah there, in Genesis chapter 10, you find that Noah had 70 descendants. Now, I did this. I took about a half hour. I took the chapter and copied and pasted it, made it really big. I got rid of Noah and his three sons, because they're like the patriarchs. And after you, if you omit them, and then you count all of the people born, it's 70 in that chapter. Now, you need to know there's plenty more people born than that. But it's intentional. He's writing down the number 70. All right? As you're told four times in chapter 10. In chapter 10, verse 5, verse 20, verse 31, and verse 32. That from these we get the nations. 
and their number is 70. All right? This is significant in the next chapter. That's why it's there. All right? We get to chapter 11, and we get more info about these descendants and their descendants, the peoples of the earth. And here's what it says in Genesis 11.1. 1. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. The whole fallen evil earth had one language and the same words. The whole earth are all the descendants of Noah and his three sons. So all of these people, all of these nations are the people by the Noahic covenant. They all speak the same language. They are yet fallen. And here it is in chapter 11 where we're told what happens next. A wicked act which causes God to intercede, resulting with God rejecting all of humanity as it stands to this point. All right, now I want everyone to take out your Bibles and open them up to Genesis chapter 11. No slides. First person who gets there, shout out the page number in the Pew Bible. Nine pages. Okay, so let's read it together. Now, let's recap. In Genesis chapter 10, we're told that there's nations and that they have their own languages. In Genesis chapter 11, you're being told how that came about. Does that sound at all familiar? See, God is repeating patterns. In Genesis chapter 1, God creates all of creation, including mankind. In Genesis chapter 2, God goes back to the beginning and fills in all the blanks that gives us details about creation and how it went down. He's doing the exact same thing here. All right? This is intentional to make you realize he's doing, he's doing, he's, he's doing another covenant. That's what's going on. All right? He's setting up another Adam. All right? Here we go. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. Remember, these are all Noah's descendants. And they all speak the same language. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. Now, I want to stop there for a second. If you remember me saying, now, I, I'm referring now to the book of Enoch. Now, I don't believe the book of Enoch is part of our Bible, but I want you to know, because Paul and Jude refer to the book of Enoch, that I'm referring to the book of Enoch. I'm not saying this is 100% true, but it is sure illuminating, and it does make sense. When in Genesis chapter 6, the sons of God came down from heaven and had sex with the women on earth and procreated, they yoked themselves with humanity. And they taught humanity tech that they weren't supposed to have. Included in that tech, by the way, is pharmacology in the book of Enoch. Metallurgy, uh, herbology, you know, all these different things is actually lit it, listed. And this kind of makes sense because when you look at Genesis 11 and you see, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And then, and then you see God come down in verse 5 and he goes, and the Lord came down to see the city and the tower. Let me see what they did with the tech that they got without me giving it to them. I mean, if we never fell, our reality would be so much different than it is today. I don't know what tech we would have and wouldn't have, but, you know, a lot of these things were introduced into the world by fallen beings. And they did it under the guise of benefiting mankind, but they knew they were actually accelerating the depravity of mankind and their own destruction. Because the demons hate you. Because you were made in the image of God to rule and reign over the earth with Yahweh. And that's what they were doing before we were made. This is the whole reason for the first fall, the second fall, and the third fall, which we're talking about today. All right? He came down, verse 5, um, saw the tower and the city which the children of man had built. Now, it's significant here. It says, and, and the Lord came down to see the city and the tower. 
The reason why that's significant is because the tower they built wasn't just the Tower of Pizza, Pisa. All right? It wasn't the Empire State Building. It was a ziggurat. A ziggurat is the main worship temple structure of a temple grounds. So when it says he came down to see the city and the tower, he is saying he came down to this uh, temple city to the main temple structure. Okay? And he said, behold, they are one people and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they purpose to do now will be impossible for them. Now, why should that be a problem, God? God, why should that be a problem? They may or may not do good or bad things. That's not the point. The point is they're not listening to God anymore. They're doing whatever they feel is right in their own minds. And we were not created for that. We are created to have union with God and, to, and to, uh, worship, to glorify and worship Him and enjoy Him forever. We were never uh, meant to be separated from God. This was all the result of a rebellious spirit, uh, spirit race and our own selfishness, our own free will, because God cannot make anybody in His image without free will, because God has free will. You see? So, verse 8. Oh no, verse 7. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the of the earth. So regarding the actions of mankind, two things happen in this section of scripture. The first one is this. Mankind chooses to be cause over God, to exert their own will over God's. They decide to build a tower. They decide to make a name for themselves. That's your main sin line there. Let's make a name for ourselves. Well, what about making a name for God? You see? What about making a name for God? I always say when people, um, philanthropists, the world's full of philanthropists who do charitable works that are very, very good. If they don't know Jesus, they're going to go to hell. And that's the reason why. If, you're not, if your life is not making a name for God, to the degree we're not doing that, it's the degree that we are acting against God. Now, praise the Lord for grace. For those of us who are in Christ, he has patience, right? And he teaches us and he grows us. But for those who reject the Messiah, they have no hope. Except that maybe one day he'll save them. And the second thing happening in this section of Scripture, humanity is once again symbolically eaten from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They did, they did, they did right? Let us, okay? Choosing for themselves, desiring and seeking to exert their free will over and contrary to God's will for mankind. After Adam and Eve fell, the angelic being who caused this fall was cursed, and he was removed from, here's a word that's going to give you a little bit of push here, he was removed from the divine council. Huh? Yes, I was sharing with the worship team before we began today. Think about it. Remember when Jesus was born and the, the shepherds are in the field and this angel's talking to him. Then all of a sudden the whole sky lights up and all the heavenly hosts were there. Glory, glory to the Lord most highest, goodwill and to man, peace on earth, right? How many angels were there? Enough to fill the sky. My point simply being, there's many, 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 many angels. How do you administer that many, 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 many angels? You have to have an organizational structure, don't you? All right? Just, and that's the way it is on earth as it is in heaven. You have the, the, the realm of spirit beings referred to as angels. In that realm are guardian angels, messenger angels, and that's actually the literal meaning of the word angel, is simply messenger. 
You have uh, leaders, you have bodyguards, you have henchmen. In the demonic, anyway. But the same thing in the angelic. You have people who go out, you know, who, get, who order people to go out, and you have people who go out. All right? The top dogs who we're going to talk about today are on the divine council. And so God, in creating these spirit beings before he created us, Genesis chapter 1, he created the heavens, right? The, the heavenly beings were created before we were created. He created them in his image. It's just that he created them as a spiritual being without bodies. As we found out last week, they actually have, some of them have the potential to, to, to inhabit bodies. And that's what they did. And that's how the Nephilim were created. All right? But you got, here's what I want you to get, is that these spirit beings are made in the image of God. They're just reflecting a fully spirit being image of God. Whereas we are made in the image of God in flesh bodies. So we, by nature, will accentuate qualities of God that the spirit beings do not, and they will accentuate qualities of God that human beings cannot. One of them being, some of them can inhabit human bodies. Right? When, when uh, God, when Yahweh gave Satan power to uh, deal with Job, what did he say to Satan? You can do whatever you want, just don't kill him. So Satan was doing things to Job in the spirit that you and I are not capable of doing because we're not spirit beings. You see? Adam and Eve were still sent out to work the earth in his image. Instead, their descendants after Noah again go against God and his plan. God disperses humanity into various nations with different languages, making it difficult to impossible for them to communicate with one another. So when we read Genesis 10, we get Noah's descendants and are told that they are the nations. And in Genesis 11, we get the details of how these descendants of Noah became different nations. All right? So where, let's recap right now. Adam fell, sent out of the garden. All right, so we have, that's man falls. In the spirit realm, we have one being who's posted in Eden, falls. We get to Genesis 6. A group of angelic beings decide to go against God, come down, have sex with human females. They come and inhabit bodies, they have sex with human females, and they create a race that God did not create. How can a race that God cannot create go to heaven? It wasn't made for them. It's only one place for them to go. Hell. The beings that came down and had sex, they are the beings that we're told in Peter and in Jude are in gloomy chains of darkness. The Nephilim, that's their children, they recreate, recreate, you get a population of giants. When they die, they lose their bodies and they wander the earth and they're in hell. The difference between the Nephilim and the sons of God, they're all in hell together, but the sons of God who fell are in gloomy chains of darkness. The Nephilim spirits, the demons, are able to go at times to the earth. All right? So that happens. God sends a flood. God uh, covenants with Noah. Noah populates the earth. Noah's descendants rebel against God and say, we're going to build a tower to God. We're going to call God down. And God disperses them. Now, here's what I, I want you to know. When God disperses them, this is what God is doing. I am done. I'm not going to deal directly with these people anymore. Instead, sons of God, because he still has a multitude of higher level angels, right? He goes, I'm going to give you control over all the nations. I'm going to appoint one for every, every nation. How many? Seventy. Remember Genesis chapter 10? All right? So it's called, in theological circles, this is called the table of nations. This is the birth of nations on planet Earth. So all the other nations grow out of these nations. 
So these nations are significant. Why are these nations significant, you ask? Well, you'll never read your New Testament the same, brothers and sisters. Because when the Apostle Paul, who's the Jew of Jews, if anyone could be a Jewish evangelist, it's the Apostle Paul. But the Apostle Paul knows more about this history than any of the other apostles because he's a Pharisee of Pharisees. So God says, I am making you, Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. Why is this? If you track, now you have to do, if you want to prove me, you're going to have to do some work. It's going to take time. When Paul talks about all the places he goes, when it says in Acts chapter 2, and you will be my witnesses in, in Ju Jerusalem and Judea, Judea and Samaria and to all the nations, right? And then you see in, as Acts unfolds, Paul goes around. Paul goes to all the nations from Genesis chapter 10. And he goes, in or he goes from east to he goes from east to west. And the final city he gets to, he's talking about it, he talks about it in Romans, is the city of Tarshish. He wants to drop off the money in Jerusalem and he tells the Roman church, and then on the way to Spain, I'm going to come to you. Why Spain? Spain is Tarshish, which is mentioned in Genesis 10. And it's the last one he has to do to fix, to bring the gospel because what God separated in Genesis 10, he begins the process of bringing back into the fold the nations on the day of Pentecost with the gift of tongues. Do you see that? So he confused their language, and then in Genesis 2, he brought the key to bringing them all back together again. So, Parallelism. We, we run into a lot of parallelism in the Bible. And um, basically what that means is that one thing runs in the same alongside the other. It reflects it, brings your attention back to it, all right? Um, <clears throat> and God uses parallelism, parallelism to show us through the Adam narrative through the Noah narrative and through the Abraham narrative that each one of these men... Abraham, Adam, Noah, Abraham are types of Jesus Christ who fall, who are imperfect, all right? Another parallelism, in the book of Genesis, Adam births how many children? Three. Adam and Eve birthed many more children than three, all right? But these three are singled out because it's significant, you see? That's weird. They only had three children. How did the world earth get populated, you know? It's significant, all right? Noah, he birthed how many children? Three. Noah, I mean Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Then we get to this guy named Abram. But to look at Abram, we have to go to Abram's father. His father's name is Terah. Terah birthed Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Genesis 11, verse 26. She's got all those things for you that you asked me for. Yeah. And I want you to consider this idea of humanity having their languages confused at Babel. It speaks of a momentary occurrence. In other words, French did not become the native tongue of one of these tribes over the centuries. It happened in a moment. Now, I'm not saying French was one of the languages. What I'm saying to you is whatever he did, it happened immediately. It didn't, didn't become something like, hey, I'm forgetting how to speak Aramaic, you know. He just did it. It's miraculous. It's supernatural. <clears throat> and it's one miracle that only Yahweh as the Lord Most High could do. Because he's Yahweh. All right? The problem with this divine counsel and these rebellions is that these demons, uh, these angel beings, want to be like God. But they're not like God. And you're not like God, and I'm not like God. We'll never be like God. What is the significant difference that makes Yahweh what's called, he's called the Lord Most High? Most High over who? Every other living being there is, whether they're spirit or flesh. He is Most High. He is what's called the Most High Elohim, the Most High God. All right? 
The distinctive that God has is his creative ability. He can speak things into existence. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. And he's ever-present. No other created being has that. Okay? So anyway, he was done dealing directly with humanity for the time being. God, at that point, assigned a select group of his spiritual children called, I'm sorry, I'm not sorry, the Bible says it. It's time we confront and adapt to what the Bible says. He appointed the sons of God to rule and reign over these various nations on his behalf. I'm going to give you this scripture in just a moment. This divine council would rule and reign along with God. And again, let me stress here. These angels or spirit beings are called by God sons of God. Because they are. He created them in his image as spirit beings. That's what makes the son of God. They were unfallen. They had free will. And some of them chose their free will over God. Sound familiar? Sound, does this, you see, we, if we follow the spirit realm, we will see that our, what, our situation on earth mirrors what's going on in the spirit realm. All right? They are not God, however, as Yahweh remains the most high God. But here's the thing you have to understand, is that the Bible doesn't shy away from calling them gods. Certainly, uh, let's take a look at the Grecian religions, the Roman religions, the Hindu religion, the Mesopotamian religion, and they're filled with gods. Because the word gods in the Hebrew is the word Elohim. And Elohim, you were taught, and I were, was taught, that the word Elohim... God means one person and one person alone. But if you look at the definition of Elohim in a lexicon, you will see that is, that's only one definition. There's numerous definitions. And all the theologians know this little secret. All the spirit beings are called gods. It's, it, you know, but the, it's not a question of are they God. The question is who will you worship? That's the problem. All right, and I'm getting to that in a moment, all right? So now, let's um, look at the prophet Daniel for a moment. We're going to turn, well, I have slides for it. Daniel 10, verses 12 through 14. Prophet Daniel talking, this is around 530 B.C. A lot of time's gone by. This is like almost 4,000 years after what we're reading about Genesis 11. A lot of time's gone by. This is what he says. Daniel 10, 12 through 14. Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. But Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days. All right? He, this isn't talking about people. All right? The angel saying, I had a conflict with a demon. All right? Except Daniel doesn't call him a demon. He calls him the prince of the kingdom of Persia. And then he says, I was left there with the kings of Persia. He's not talking about men. He's talking about the other demons. See, if you take Persia, we're talking about, um, I have it written down here, which surprised me. It's, it's, it's the countries you'd think. Here it is. Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan. You know who else is classified as in the kingdom of Persia? Russia. I didn't know this. So if you have Persia, you have one spirit being over it. Now, if you go down into Persia and you go to Iraq, there's a spirit being over that, over there. If you go to Iran, there's a spirit being over there. Who do they report to? The king of Persia, right? Right on down into cities, into towns, counties, just like our civil structure. Look at our government today and how it operates, the same structure, all right? <clears throat> and they report to their top dog. Now, is this anywhere in Scripture? Yes. All right. We'll begin with the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. 
He says this, in their case, the God of this world. Who's that? Satan's a God? Is Satan a God? He's just not a potent God. And we don't worship him. Okay? In their case, the God of this world, see, that's, that's who worships him. The people of the world that don't know Jesus, right? The God of this world has blinded their, the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Now, in the case of the God of this world means there is a specific spirit being who is fallen, who's over the earth. And that's who we call... Exactly. Now, that may or may not be right, but that's besides the point. point. What is right is there's one being who's top dog. Then you have the prince of Persia, prince of Iran, prince of Iraq, prince of, you know, a town in Iraq, right on down the list. And they all report to the person over them, just like we would, right? I thought I brought batteries. Here we go. Yeah, but it's dying. That was my warning. That was my shot to the bow there. Sorry. All right. So, uh, Satan, the Satan the one specific adversary whom I believe to be the fallen angel who caused Adam to fall is the fallen son of God who has rule over the fallen earth and fallen humanity and all of the other fallen beings. I could be right, I could be wrong. There's no rule that says that first demon has to be the one. In my mind, I think, well, he was the one that started it all. I think that gives him a little clout. So I think that's probably who's in charge of the demons, all right? Although we know who's in charge ultimately, because God is still on the throne. Next reference is um, Ephesians 3.10. Again, the Apostle Paul. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in every city. Somebody correct me. In heavenly places. In heavenly places. All right? So there are, there are spirits who are running things, fallen spirits over the world, because the world has fallen, all right? Speak, this speaks of the total group of fallen spirit beings, regardless of rank, who have some authority over geographical places, nations, cities, towns, and such. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 4, go back to Corinthians, Apostle Paul. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Strongholds are defined as anything under the influence of the demonic. All right? Our fight, therefore, is not against our fellow man first. This goes to what I was talking about before church began, Fred. It's not against our fellow man first, but primarily over the spirits who influence these people to be adversaries of the Lord God Most High and his people. So if we define the word Elohim to describe all disembodied spirit beings and the word gods, which is what Elohim means, as another descriptive word of these created spirit beings, here's the question, and here's the main argument you'll get when you start talking about these things. You're a pantheist. You believe in many gods. And it's kind of like, well, hold the phone. That's not the definition of a pantheist, by the way. A pantheist worships many gods. We worship Yahweh because he is unique, he is supreme, and he is in charge. We simply acknowledge that there are spirit beings and that the language that the Bible uses for these spirit beings is the word Elohim. Okay? But God, Yahweh, is uh, the most high God, and so all these other spirit beings are called sons of God. All right? Outside of Genesis and in Job, the term sons of God ceases to be used of any spirit being except one. 
the son of God in the furnace with David. Specific reference to Jesus. And that term then comes back into use in the New Testament. Except now, the angelic is never referred to as the son of God. You are. Because we will rule over angels. And I know that's such a crazy concept. I tried to like grasp it as I was writing it. And I think, how will I rule over angels? I, I can't even rule my own life half the time. I'm a train wreck half the time. I, 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 God is God. You know what I mean? I'm going to let him do with me as he wills. And if he tells me that I will rule a nation or over angels, he will give me the capacity to do so. Amen? Our goal is simply to seek to live by his word now to facilitate the transformation he's doing in each one of us. Amen? We begin as created beings created, the Bible says, a little lower than the angels. But as believers, we, we are and will be exalted by God to rule and to reign with him as his sons over the angels. And there's no daughters there because it's not a sexual description. It's speaking of firstborn sons, like the, the, the men in the family in the Jewish culture and in that surrounding culture of religions. It's the men, you know what I mean? And so that's what it's talking about, all right? That we have privilege. We are being exalted and elevated by God over the angels. So here we are. The world now is nations. All these people speak different languages. They're being ruled by sons of God. And these sons rebel against God. Third fall. Another group of beings go. And here's what they do. They go, you know what? Let's go down and teach them more tech. Let's go down and show, and, 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 and we'll... Um, We'll give them power above all of these other places, you know. And, and what happens is Mesopotamia becomes the hallmark of this. And they look at themselves as the civilization of civilizations. And their reason for saying that is because they're more advanced than most of the civilizations. And they credit these beings, their gods, as the source of this. It's all a good thing. You see, Murdoch usurped the evil one, Anil. But what's actually happened in their religion is they've, gave, they've given Satan the throne and threw away Yahweh. All right? So all throughout the New Testament, Jesus is going around to all of these demons, all of these principalities and powers, all of this cosmic turf that belongs to the enemy, and he's taking it all back. He goes to the literal gates of hell on earth, Caesarea Philippi, and then takes his, his uh, three most trusted disciples, James, John, and Peter, and he takes them to Hermon, to where this gate is, and he transfigures. And Moses and Elijah show up. What Jesus is doing is he's taking back cosmic turf. He's taking back the earth that was given to these demons. In um, the Old Testament, when uh, Israel goes to battle against the Philistines, they lose. And they brought the ark, and they weren't supposed to. They did it wrong, everything they did wrong. And God gives the Philistines the ark. And the Philistines take the ark back to Philistia, and they put the ark in the temple of Dagon. Dagon, however you want to say it. And every day they come back and Dagon, the statue of Dagon's fallen over with another broken arm. That finally, one day they come in, I think it's the third day, and Dagon's completely over and smashed to bits. And then it says, and the priests would not step on that, pro that would not, would step over the, I forget what they say, but they would, they would walk around where this temple, where this thing fell. Because they recognized that in God doing that, he was taking back the ground. And so they would only be harmed if they went on that ground. Because geography was very, very important back then. All right? All right. So humans who were commanded to go out in the image of their creator and subdue the earth are acting less and less like their creator. See, all of these events that are happening, uh, Satan in the garden, getting them to choose on their own. 
the sons of God and the Nephilim, giving them tech, having them forget about God and just start worshiping these guys. Tower of Babel comes, they do it again. Mankind is going further and further and further away from God. And his attitude really, I'm done. All right? He's turned over the earth to them because where else can damned beings go? They can't go to heaven. And that is why hell is associated with the earth, the abyss. Shul. You see? So what happens next? The rebellion happens at the Tower of Babel. Psalm 82, verses 1 through 7. I have it up here. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. I'm going to stop right there. This psalm is describing what God does at the Tower of Babel in the spirit realm. All we got in Genesis 11 is what he does to man because God is dealing with man. This tells us what he does with the spirits. He goes to the divine council. He goes to this group of beings who he gave power, right? And he goes, verse 2, How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Selah. In other words, think about that. Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. All right? So he just described things they are not doing. He just described how you act if you are an imager of God. You're going out in the image of the Father. You are made in his image. You're going to be those things. These guys are doing the exact opposite. They're corrupt. They're favoring the wicked. All right? And then he pronounces judgment. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. What's he saying? They have, these angelic beings have deceived man even more. They have fallen even quicker and even deeper than they were after the Noahic flood. All right? I said, you are gods, the sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men you shall die and, like, and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. You want to keep that slide up for a second? So when he says, like men, you shall die, he's not saying, therefore, I condemn every spirit being that's fallen to have a body and die in the flesh. That's not what he's saying. He's talking about hell. That is the common thing. The fallen beings and human beings who are fallen have in common when they die. They go to hell. All right? Arise, O God, and judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. That last verse is the good news. It's like, it's like Jesus, uh, God in Genesis chapter 3, when he says to Satan, you shall bruise his ankle, but he shall crush your head. It's looking forward. That's what this is doing. Because in verse 8, we're talking about he just created all the nations. He just dispersed everybody. He just wrote them all off. And now he's saying in verse 8, but the day is coming where all the nations will be and are my inheritance. All right? So while the sons of God who procreated with humanity in Genesis 6 are currently imprisoned by gloomy chains of darkness in hell until the judgment, that's 2 Peter 2, 4, and Jude 6. If you want to read about it, it's in your bulletins, right? The demons we deal with today are the disembodied Nephilim, as well as the fallen sons of God who fell after they were commissioned by God to rule and reign over those nations God dispersed at Babel. So those leaders of the 70 nations who fell in the spirit, these are your, these are your leading demons. The Nephilim are the henchmen. So if you defeat some demons, big deal. What about the guy who's the principality in power? That's who we want to get, right? None of them have authority over you. You need to know. None of them. Their job with you as believers is to simply convince you they do. And to get you down, to get you depressed, to get you not victorious in your life. 
to rob you of your joy, to steal, to kill, and destroy. Because all they want to do is rob glory from Yahweh. All right? So the condition of mankind is described in this way. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. Meaning, these fallen spirits forsook Yahweh and the ways that he called them to rule, and they went their own way. And so did man. All right? This is the history of man. And, and, and God is going to great pains in Genesis 1 through 12, let's say, to show us that we cannot save ourselves. We cannot be God. We cannot presume to order God around. And we cannot save ourselves. Only God can. <clears throat> so one last judgment is made by God that I haven't spoken about yet. And that, you want to go to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 8. And this is cool. This is what it says. When the Most High God gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, this is a direct reference to Genesis chapter 11. All right? That's what he's talking about. When he did this, he fixed the borders of the people according to the number of the sons of God. Remember, he appointed them over these nations before they fell. So he said, that's your nation, that's your nation, that's your nation, that's your nation. And then he goes, but the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob, his allotted heritage. What's the problem with that verse? There's no Jacob. <laughs> there is no Jacob. God is speaking about something new he is going to create out of thin air. It's going to be even greater than that of the air because he's going, to, he's going to do this through a pagan, an other worshiper afterwards. There's no Jacob yet. There's no Israel. There's no Abraham. There's no Isaac. And yet he's saying Jacob is his allotted inheritance. Okay? God's solution is not in what is but in what is not. He would speak something new into existence. Yahweh would begin to make all things new, starting with the man named Abram, that he would call Abraham, and Sarai, whom he would call Sarah. If you read the account, it's either Genesis 12 or 14, when he tells Abraham he's going to make Sarai pregnant, and both of them do the same thing. They laugh. They're like, actually, I don't think Abraham laughed. Sarah laughed. And God's like, this is perfect. This is perfect. I'm going to grab a Gentile and make them mine, and then I'm going to make his 80-year-old wife pregnant. Why? So that you all know, so that you all know, you fallen beings, that I have the power to do this, and you don't. I will have my way, says the Lord. Yahweh would begin to make all things new, starting with Abraham and Sarah, pagans from a pagan land, Mesopotamia, a town named Ur, located in the Chaldees. They would birth the nation of Israel, through whom the Messiah of the world would come. God is calling in these chapters, and next week we'll see it more, Israel into existence. His portion, ethnic Israel. No less than he did in Genesis 1 when Yahweh spoke over the formless earth void of anything living completely dark. In Genesis 1-3, let there be light, and there was light. And no less than when he said to his children, live, right? I'm thinking of the valley of dry bones. Speak to those dry bones. And they start cricketing and they start getting flesh. Only God can do this. How about this? 
you got saved. You weren't born a Christian. You might have been born into a professing Christian home, but you weren't born saved. You were born damned. You were born in a state that no man can fix. Impossible. You were born in a state that no spirit being could help you with. And that's their deception when they come down to help you. They'll give you all these kinds of things that are light, right? The, the ministers of Satan, they'll, they'll dress as ministers of light, they'll speak to you light, and they'll give you just enough poison so that you're damned. They want to see you dead. They want to see you burn. But God saved us, and he said to each one of us, let there be light. Amen? Father God, I thank you, Lord, and praise your holy name. Next week, we're going to go into God's calling of Abraham, the covenant God strikes with Abraham, and to set things straight with mankind. Amen? Lord, you be glorified. We praise your holy name. I thank you, Lord, that you are Yahweh. You are the Lord most high. You are the God of our lives. There is no other Lord. Among all, all the little G's, there is no big G but you. You are the Elohim. And so we love you and we worship you. And we look forward to how you're going to use this man, Abraham, next week when we talk about your covenant in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Take the worship team.